You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Solana, Doge, and more. Cryptocurrencies and digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity, provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments throughout the world's leading crypto derivatives markets. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on The Crypto Rundown. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of crypto derivatives. It's time for The Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the old network where we venture outside our traditional stomping grounds. Not going to talk about VIX or SPY or Apple or Tesla options or any of that fun. Going to look a little bit further afield, see what's going on in those crypto markets. Maybe going to talk a little Bitcoin, ETH. Who knows? It's going to sprinkle on top. Solana, all sorts of fun. That's why you got to tune in every week to find out. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as from the ever-exciting aforementioned network. Reminding you, of course, if you like this show, make sure you're checking out the rest of the content on the network. We do touch on crypto quite a bit on our This Week in Futures Options program that we do every week over there with CME, looking at the listed world of crypto derivatives. If you're intrigued by that, the big contracts, you know, the big Bitcoin, the big ETH, as well as the micro size, check out that show. A lot of other stuff going on in that program as well. Of course, a lot of great guests coming through our pro Q&A sessions as well. So you want to check those out. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. Quite a few crypto guests coming in there. Got another one popping off tomorrow. Options oddities at the end of every week. And of course, we're about to give away our April pro trading crate to one of you lucky pro members out there. So theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go to learn more as we go to discover who's joining us today in the crypto hot seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the Crypto, crypto hot, hot Seat. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the show where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you. The listener and next up is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Jag Sidhu, the co-founder and lead core developer of the Syscoin platform. Jag, welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me on. And Jag, as we are wont to do with all of our first timers here on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the crypto space as well as what it is you do day to day over there at the Syscoin platform. 
Uh, yeah, so I, I have a, a software, a professional software experience of about 25 years. Uh, I've focused a lot on uh, client server and AI and, uh, and machine learning and then um, naturally kind of gravitate towards uh, the concepts of blockchain and, and digital money uh, in, um, around 2013 and then uh, kind of started developing and, and trying tinkering and different things. And um, I, I was always very philosophical in my um, in my endeavors with this technology rather than uh, financial. And I just felt like it's a, it's a potential way for us to get more involved to uh, usher in a new um, kind of new a new vanguard in how we establish value information, how we communicate with one another, one another, and then eventually how AI intersects. And, um, and we alleviate some of the pain points that we're, we're going to have with AI itself. AI, very hot buzzword these days. We're seeing that crossover into a lot of our other programming as well. A lot of trading action, a lot of volatility, a lot of volume being driven by all things AI these days. But catch us up for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with everything you have cooking over there on the Syscoin platform. Been around for a bit since way back in 2014. So that qualifies as Pretty much OG in the crypto space, pretty darn close to it. Uh, number 249 these days in the top coin market cap ranking. So I'll give our listeners a little bit of an overview of Syscoin and the Syscoin platform. Yeah, so we started out uh, kind of early on thinking uh, we need to create uh, something other than store of value using uh, te- the technology. And at that time, it was uh, pre-Ethereum. Uh, so there's no concepts of smart contracts, so the, you know, master coin uh, was kind of being established and the, the thought process was we can potentially also uh, do some sort of early contracting sort of using the blockchain uh, and not using a concept of money, but more of as a utility or gas. Uh, so we were tinkering around with that. I, I kind of came in early um, and, and took over the development of the project. Uh, the first sort of things we were thinking about was a security model. So we established uh, a protocol called Merge Mining where we, borrow the security from Bitcoin directly and we secure our network. And that's important because at that time, uh, there was a lot of people mining coins and, and con- trying to control the networks and doing 51% attacks. So we uh, had to kind of find, find ways to secure ourselves without um, you know, creating a, isolated risks while we launched the network. Merge mining was, uh, was a con- concept laid out by Satoshi in the early days. And, uh, you know, it's a novel concept to not being a kind of a, um, a green carbon neutral solution while still tapping into the Bitcoin network directly. And then we, we ventured into what sort of services would be really interesting for people to do, uh, you know, kind of smart contract side of things. And we coded those into our protocol and those were e-commerce and identity and a few uh, escrow and a few services like that. And even the first iterations of NFTs started to come out um, back in probably 2015, 2016. Um, and, and then at that point, we realized that in order for us to scale, uh, we need to kind of take a step back and look at how um, we use the blockchain more as a court system rather, rather as a Visa MasterCard transaction processor. So after taking a step back, we realized that you know there's still some time for us to um, research and find how to use this technology in a more efficient way so that when inevitably the world is going to turn to this tech, it doesn't break down. And that's the thought process that Bitcoin's had, um, you know, focusing on the Lightning Network instead of trying to reinvent itself on Bitcoin itself. And that was a thought process we've had where we, we were considering potentially integrating smart contracts, but doing it in a way that once it's fully adopted, it remains secure and scalable and uh and cost efficient so coming into around 2019 um we've started to see the advent of zero knowledge proofs and uh, the privacy succinctness as well as the scalability um uh, features that would come out of that and so in around 2020 we, we launched the evm with uh, a roadmap for modularity so that we would have sort of like a dual stack layer where you follow the best of breed security through Bitcoin, you follow the best of breed uh, flexibility of Ethereum, the EVM, and then um, and, and following the modular roadmap, we get to kind of the the, the best in class scalable secure network. Uh, as soon as we can finalize that modular uh, roadmap, and that's just completing now. As of pretty much last month, we've introduced our 
kind of our data layer, which allows our, our roll-ups, which happen on the EVM, very similar to some of these other uh, projects like Arbitrum and Optimism and Starkware. Uh, these, these guys have roll-ups on Ethereum. Uh, we are just launching them on Ethereum, and they are coupled with the data layer that will unlock the Visa MasterCard level of scalability that you need for users uh, to keep the gas costs cheap and yet uh, transact day to day, you know, within seconds. So that's kind of uh, laying the gra- groundwork for our actual release for these layer twos coming out um, in the next couple months. Here, yeah, we're, we're on the cusp there. You know, we have a lot of guests come on the show who are. Working on new projects, they're very much new things. We don't have a lot of guests coming on who've been grinding away on the same project for nearly a decade now, so that's always interesting. I'm always curious what kind of lessons people have learned from working on something for that long. It sounds like one of the big takeaways from you guys is to take the best practices you've seen in the space and, and adopt it to your platform. Is that fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Like it's The realization that less is more uh, It's the realization that the blockchain is a court system, not a transaction processor. And it's the realization that modularity um, through the help of zero-knowledge zero proofs as well as the data data availability aspect of things, which are some core innovations we've introduced, um, are the way forward, are the way for humans to be able to um, create governance, global governance processes that, that everyone, once it adopts, can depend on without being broken down when people do try to depend on, like, for example, some of the blockchains. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but some of the blockchains that are monolithic in design where everyone is trying to cram in the same spot. They tend to break down after, you know, you get to a few hundred transactions a second and or the fees become exorbitantly high. And so to avoid those situations, you, you really do have to create modular kind of layers. And that's, you know, at the end of the game, you're, you're trying to create economies of scale. Uh, you're trying to make it cheaper or more cost efficient for infrastructure to run based on the number of users and the number of transactions. And that's just how the internet scaled up, right? It, it, it wasn't. It didn't make sense for ISPs to, to run the infrastructure of the internet until it was cost efficient for economies of scale, and that's how we think about blockchain as well. How do we, you know, was it even possible prior to 2019? We didn't see kind of a pathway to that, but after that, we kind of saw there was this pathway, and that's you know kind of where we're at is without degrading security and taking shortcuts on the security or decentralization, we're able to get to economies of scale um, in, in a proper way without you know, taking those, those fallbacks that other networks potentially would have done. Feel free to name names here, uh, Jack. We know we're all about naming names here on the show. So just you and I talking. <laughs> just two guys talking. Nobody else listen. Just, just you and I chatting here. Uh, but you, know, you mentioned the scale. That's always been an issue. Obviously, we come at crypto from the capital markets perspective. So one of the big pushbacks we've seen in this space, whether it's coming from uh, people who are traditional longtime financial services people or even people on the the retail side who are discovering these markets now for the first time. One of the traditional pushbacks we hear is, oh, whether it's Bitcoin or the core underpinning blockchain technology or any of the other legion of projects that are out there these days is that, you know, they, they can't scale up. There's no there there. They can't really make it to the level of transactions. When you're talking about MasterCard earlier or looking out at a, a basic stock exchange, let alone an options exchange with how many quotes and how much messaging is flying back around on a sub second level. The notion that, you know, crypto still is not there, but it sounds like you're a little bit more optimistic, Jag. You think some of these additions you're making in the coming months could maybe get us a little bit closer to that mystical level of scale where we could really start pushing some volume through them? Yeah. I mean, I mean, to, to, to take a step back, I, I think. So the push towards in the Ethereum world is, um, and, and generally in the smart contract world, is you'll run a virtual machine, right? A virtual machine is responsible for, in a general way, to respond to any sort of software that's running there for you. You can code up anything and dream up anything. The problem is, um, they most of the times they intersect with the ability to compute in parallel. So um, you know, if you have two separate users uh, talking to the same system, like Uniswap. They generally have to happen in order. And because they're generally happening in order, things tend to slow down. So typically when you're talking about NASDAQ or these stock exchanges, things are very paralyzed or kept in CPU cache or layer two cache in the CPU. Uh, so that's very efficient. And then they're using a ring buffer to make sure things are running as fast as possible sequentially. So that's just a long ways away from um, running a virtual machine that 
probably using SSD to look up things from the hard drive, and it's really, really slow. You're never going to get that level of scale unless you rethink the tech stack. And the way we think about it is the virtual machines that are writing for these uh, these more contract platforms are really just base base layers. And the custom custom environments, like you're talking about the NASDAQ uh, use case, what you're trying to solve there is you're, you're trying to remove custody so people have self-sovereign value that they own, they control, they're their own bank, but they want to go and spend something. They want to go trade in, in a millisecond uh, speed. They, they would have to go into, um, you know, we can devise those solutions uh, by putting them on the blockchain, but without encumbering them back into a custom virtual machine. First, A, you don't want to have them recode everything because the engines are already been built. And B, uh, the, the virtual machines themselves are too slow on the base layers. And you do, you definitely do need those custom engines to be running natively. So there's ways to solve those, and they, they, our roadmap there differs from what uh, Polygon and these other groups. And I think Polygon, Matter Labs, and Starkware are the three, and Optimism, the Optimism, and there as well, three leading teams on Ethereum that have plans to scale up once you have the, you know, once you break down the blockchain from layer one, which is Ethereum, and then you have layer two, which is Polygon or some of these other ones. Their plans are to create uh, the third layers, kind of like as a tree structure, where you have uh, these these custom integrations. But they're, in their case, they're running virtual machines as well on layer three. So you you end up having the problems all down the entire stack. And our take is uh, the layer one and layer two could definitely keep staying as a virtual machine, like an EVM or whatever smart contract platform. It's sturdy, it's secure, it's decentralized, um, and it's composable with liquidity across all systems. But these third layers we're thinking currently are more on the custom side. So, for example, if you want to run a stock exchange in Java code, you should be able to do that. And um, you should be able to support one to four million orders a second. So th- those are, that's the d- differing kind of ideology that we have compared to everyone else. And we're executing on that roadmap. But in general, you can see that as things get broken down, they get faster and faster on, on the the final legs or the third or fourth layers that start to be, uh, be created, it's getting faster and faster. While uh, you know, above the stack is more secure and decentralized, you get centralized experiences, but in the end, you're trying to keep custody out of the picture. You're trying to keep self-sovereignty and censorship resistance um, throughout, you know, throughout that picture. And that's, that's the goal of the entire stack. You're, you don't have a silver bullet where you're able to put every single device and every single thing in a totally decentralized way and it's totally you know free it, it that doesn't there's nothing that's free in this world so um you end up you just have to end up breaking down the solution in a way that makes sense you know, where the users value decentralization they want to settle on something that's decentralized that can never be taken away and it's fully auditable you use the base layers right you, you know you'd, you'd be waiting for a couple of seconds for a transaction and where you want to do your trading or you want to have your casino or you want to do your game uh, transactions, you want to put your game on, on the blockchain, then you start to get in these these, these uh, lower layers where the game is to just remove custody. And you could potentially be censored, but in that way, you just you would just exit the game with your value and you just can't do the game. You're censored from the applications rather than from the, uh, from your, the value that you hold itself. So that's the kind of way we're thinking about it is um, there are no silver bullets. ZK allows us to get economies of scale, but you still have to think about um, structure and how you produce a product that will allow people to experience this technology seamlessly, but also uh, how to make sure that the experience and composability makes sense without, again, going back to first principles of Bitcoin. And then the second component is um not everything will fit within a virtual machine. So where does it make sense to have businesses build off of the virtual machine? And where does it make sense for them to build their custom environments to to um, enable their experiences with blockchain? That was great. A really deep dive. You know, we always kind of scratch the surface here of scale and what's holding some of these projects back from really meeting the scale uh, that we need in the capital market space. But that was a that was a fascinating look. I appreciate that there, Jag. You know, speaking of fascinating. I just came back from a big industry conference here, the Options Industry Conference. And I know you, Jag, and most of the crypto world just came back from consensus. I'll have to find a year, some year where those two don't overlap, and maybe I can make my first trip down 
uh, to consensus for us, for our audience, OIC has to come first. But I know uh, for you folks out there, consensus was a big deal. I was kind of following along virtually on Twitter during the week there, Jag. But I'm curious for you, for our listeners who aren't familiar, maybe never been there, describe consensus for them and what was your takeaway from the event? Uh, yeah, I heard options was pretty good too, by the way, um, from, from some of our friends. <laughs> there actually yeah, were a really surprising good. number of crypto firms at the options conference this year. So a little bit of overlap. It's always yeah. nice to see. No, there was. And there was some Web2 people at, uh, pure Web2 people at Consensus as well. So it was refreshing to see the mix of you know, kind of what we're seeing is Web2.5 onboarding of um, the, the Web2.0 world into Web3. Uh, so it was uh, really exciting to see how businesses from uh, mostly, you know, the Audi East or Mensa regions are trying to take advantage because the, the demand side is much higher there than uh, obviously North America, which is more heavily regulated. So, But last year was the first year in Austin, Texas, and it was kind of a little bit unorganized, I would say, in the second year. was uh, This year was actually done fairly well. You know, it used to be in New York, but um, I guess they found a really good opportunity here. And the spaces and the parties and stuff were more available out here. So we threw a nice party out the Sky Lounge and um, it was very well received. And we introduced our Layer 2 brand name called Rolux. And it was funny that we just branded around, you know, with, with food trucks and, and different things. And people saw our brand as Rolux. They didn't even associate it that with this coin, which is a 10-year-old brand name. It was, it was funny that we were able to receive that new brand that we just launched at Consensus and nowhere before that. Uh, and it was uh, much more recognized than when we, when people came to our party. They're like, oh, you guys are the Syscoin team. Oh, okay, I, I get it now. Right? It, they thought that um, Rolex was a completely separate product. So that was uh, really, really interesting. But overall, uh, I thought it was more professional. Um, the ecosystem parties were har- higher ROI. And uh, overall, uh, the networking opportunities were, were, were better. People you know, definitely in bear markets, people like to work with each other more than uh, in bull markets and people are just looking for flashy things. And uh, and, it, and so we, we're infrastructure people, right? We're at the ground zero building this stuff and, and thinking about this and thinking about the future of how all of the people and tech is going to build on top. So for us, uh, that was a breath of fresh air to be able to, you know, be well received in the community and people and everyone knew and understand understood our positioning uh, and we weren't flooded with the NFT monkeys and stuff like that. Uh, it was more about providing real value back to people and connecting the dots rather than, you know, um, just selling certain, uh, you know, uh, we would, what we'd say Ponzi schemes in the crypto you space. You didn't want to buy any more board ape NFTs? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Jack? <laughs> well, those ones are okay, but everyone <laughs> has their own non utility based <laughs> NFT that just didn't make sense. We'll come up against it, but you mentioned Rolex there really quickly. Why don't you hit on that really quickly for our audience? As you mentioned, there is some confusion where your brand ends and that begins. So clarify really quickly what that is and what you're doing with it. Yeah, like I was saying, if you want to scale up blockchain, you have to avoid uh, re-execution. And that means like everyone that's participating in this network, just like if you're running a computer, you don't want to have to reproduce all of the calculations that everyone else is doing. So in order to do that, you have to start breaking things up and do in the components and our layer two, you know, our layer one is secured through Bitcoin and it's, uh, it's slow, it's decentralized, it's secure, it's stable. And then the layer two, um, starts to get faster. We're able to get to the, the higher speeds uh, that are required to service users for DeFi and GameFi and all these, um, these cool things that are coming out that are needed again to settle on the, on the blockchain. It's sort of as our, it's our home base for our, uh, smart contracting EVM. Uh, and then that that layer two is, is is our base to launch these custom execution environments. So Rolux is really the layer two that's coming out as part of our strategy to uh, to really get going. And you're going to be hearing more and more here in the near future as we launch in the next couple of months. It, it's going to become pretty popular um, because we, you know, it's the first sort of we can say it's the first roll up uh, as you uh, that's the technical term on top of Bitcoin basically. Well, fascinating stuff there, Jag. Unfortunately, we have to keep rolling on with the show. But before we go here, you mentioned a lot of things 
coming down the pike in the very near future for you guys. If our listeners are intrigued, they want to keep up with all these developments and watch them as they unfold in the marketplace, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, yeah, so we, we can um, direct people over to syscoin.org or rollox.com. And, uh, and there's links there for the discords and telegram chats. We're always in there and we're happy to answer any questions. So love to uh, have the, um, uh, the inquiring folks jump in there and, and shoot us a message and we will get back to you. But, but, uh, yeah, all the, all the white papers and information and portals are definitely on, on those pages. There you go. Check it out. Syscoin.org, the place to go to learn more and keep an eye on all these interesting new developments coming down the pike. In the coming months, as we keep on rolling with the show, right on into the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the The Bitcoin Bitcoin Breakdown. Breakdown. All right, everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we dive a little bit deeper into the world's leading digital asset, which is, of course, Bitcoin coming into showtime. We're seeing it a little bit higher after a little bit of uh, bounding around <laughs> over the course of the past week. And on our last show, we were hanging out back in that, that 27,000 range, 27,347 to be precise. Coming into the start of today's show, we're a little bit higher, not quite back at the lofty 30 plus thousand range we flirted with not too long ago, but at a little bit north. The bulls will take it these days, 28,133. When we kicked off the show, up about 785 handles on the week. The high came last Friday, right as I was coming back from OIC. Listeners kissing ever so close to breaking the 30K level. Couldn't quite get the muster up to do it. 29,973 was the high. Uh, The low came the day before, 27,277. So you're talking a pretty impressive range. Yet again, just over the span of 24 hours talking about 2,700 handles there and it's to the upside and then coming right back down. So uh, no surprise then that the vol remaining a little bit firmer this week. We were at 49 and a half on the show last week, 50 and three quarters this week. By the way, you want to kick the tires and light the fires on all this data we're going to talk about here on the show today. Then there's only one place to go, Amber Data, A-M-B-E-R-D-A-T-A dot I-O, the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires out there. You'd see all this vol, all this data, and that's really just scratching the surface, just the tip of the iceberg of what they have to offer over there. So check it out for yourselves, amberdata.io. As we keep looking, let's go a little bit farther out too. Why not? We mentioned going farther out from a skew perspective. There isn't always a ton of evolution from a vol perspective if you go a little bit farther out the term structure, but it's worth looking, casting a glance, see what we find. Usually when we're quoting vol listeners, we're quoting front months, so 30 days out. And let's go a little bit farther. Let's go about half a year. Let's go 180 days and see what we can find, listeners. And the vol, they're a little bit higher, 52 and three quarters, so pretty much exactly two points higher. Not a huge evolution there. Let's keep rolling and see what we find on the skew front. Maybe some changes are in store for us there. Uh, last week on the show, we were at about almost a negative two which shows a slight bias, obviously, in favor of the puts. That's, of course, again, just the front month, the 30-day, which is very important when you're talking about skew. That's where the lion's share of the action that's coming in to really, really bang away and try to capture some of these moves we're talking about. Most of that's going to be, quote-unquote, high gamma within the first month of trading-type contracts. So if you go a little bit farther out, a little bit longer term, things usually get a little bit calmer, a little bit more even keel. Let's see what the skew is if we go a little bit farther out. By the way, the skew right now is positive 0.5. So it has swung over two points uh, to the upside, which again, we did flirt ever so briefly with that 30K level. So maybe not surprising. We're seeing a little bit. Let's go a little bit farther out and see what the skew has in store for us. Once again, let's go out about half a year. Uh, This time last week, we were about half a point positive. So pretty much flat. There really was no bias in either direction. This week, we're seeing a slight bias to the upside, about three and a half positive this week so again flirting with 30k that's probably going to happen that's not a huge bias but it's not nothing either if you're out there looking at maybe selling some covered calls and things like that a little bit of extra juice to the call wing is always going to be welcome for you of course since the last time we gathered here together on the show listen you have seen april roll off the board and it's not a quarterly so it's not going to take as much as let's say march did from an open interest perspective 
the quarterlies are really just the kings of the road when it comes to open interest in crypto. Bitcoin is starting to move a little bit beyond that. ETH still very firmly fixed in that paradigm. But April did take some paper with it. Coming into the start of the show, we had 188,000, actually 189,000 contracts open on Deribit on the call front. That's down 33,000 from this time last week. On the put front, we have 88,000 puts open. That's down about 27,000. So you're still hanging out pretty close to that two to one calls over puts level that Deribit has hung out at seemingly since time immemorial almost out there. Let's go out to the top five. Let's see if we have any shakeups. And when we see this much OI roll off the board, usually some changeups are in store on the top five. Let's see what we got this week. Number five, we have the 25,000 strike, 14,000 contracts open. That's down about 4,200 contracts from this time last week. Number four, we have the 35,000 strike. So quite a jump. From the 25K strike to the 35,000 strike. That's got 13,300 contracts open. That's new to the top five. So it actually looks like uh, they have those reversed here in our top five. Let's go out. So that should be the 25K strike at number four and the 35K strike coming in at number five. Interesting stuff there. Again, the newcomer slotting in right to the bottom with 13,300 contracts. The number four, the 25,000 strike. With 14,000 contracts open, that's down 4,200. In fact, once again, we have a tie for four slash three because the 40,000 strike also hanging out at about exactly 14,000 contracts open. That one's down about 4,800 this week. So that number three slash four spots, kind of hard to get a clear winner there. A lot of ties going on in that range there. So we're all over the place too. 25,000, 35,000, 40,000. Let's see if we can come back down to earth for the top two. Number two, 32,000 strike, 15,100 contracts open. That's down about 3,000 on the week. And number one, still not surprisingly, the 30K strike, 18,000 contracts open there. That's down about 3,400 from this time last week. So a lot of OI coming off the board. A little bit of a shakeup there. Again, the 30K strike maintaining its chokehold on the outlook, the optimism, the interest of most of the crypto and Bitcoin options traders out there this week. Let's go a little bit farther afield to a product I know a lot of you love. When we kicked off the show, Bitto was hanging out at about a 1635. That puts it pretty much unched on the week. As the show has progressed, we were talking about all things Syscoin there. We have seen a little bit of a sell-off out there in Bitto. It's down to about a 1618 now, so actually down a little bit on the week. In terms of paper, Starting to shape up for a decent day out there. We have about 44, actually about 34,000 contracts on the tape right now. The ADV is 44,000. Still moving in the wrong direction, down another 8,000 this week. Remember, this ADV not too long ago was close to 100,000 contracts a day. So I'm not quite sure what it is that is eating into the ADV for Bitto, why folks are trading less contracts out there. I mean, the underlying has been moving. It's at a decently lofty level. It's not hanging out at an 8 or a 6. At 16 is a pretty decent level to be trading options on. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe it was in the past we had some pretty pronounced bids to either the puts or the calls. So the skew was attractive for people who wanted to sell covered calls to the upside or sell puts to the downside to get into Bitto. And right now we don't really have that. We don't have a demonstrable bid in either direction. So maybe that's taking away some of the flow. I'm not really not sure what it is that's uh, that's hitting Bitto ADV so hard because we are seeing volume in some of the other products out there. Right now, the 30-day skew is a little bit more biased towards the puts again. It's about a negative 11 listener. So that's a little bit more pronounced than what we're seeing on the Bitto, I should say on the Bitcoin options front over there on Derrick. But, but also worth noting, it's still only in the third percentile. <laughs> so we have a ways to go if you want to see some interesting actual skew pop up. And if that starts happening, I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing some of these aggressive put sales start popping back up again, whether it's the 10 strike or others that really seem to have captured the imagination out there. Let's see what's going on out there right now. If you look at the top 10 size positions in Bitto options this week, Looks like we're shifting heavily into the call realm. Seven calls in the top 10, only three puts to be found. So not a lot of put action out there, which again, kind of goes back to what we were talking about. Maybe a lot of the use case for the puts out here, people aren't buying them. They're looking to sell them as a little bit of an income play, as a way to get long a little bit of bid potentially. And 
they're not seeing the levels that they want out here. It's it's interesting either way. Number 10, we have 13,000 of the May 17 halves. So that was an at-the-money strike about a week ago. Uh, number nine, we have the first of three puts, 13,000 of the June 10 puts. Again, that strike I know in the past has captured a lot of people's imagination. It'll be interesting to see what kind of puts we find here in the top 10. Number eight, right behind you, we have 17, almost 18,000 of the June 5 puts. That's intriguing. I'll have to dig that up. Maybe a little bit of a, a vertical going up there. Maybe a one by two. Not quite one to one or not quite one by two on the ratio. It's more like one by one and a half. But intriguing. How would you like that, listeners? Buy one, sell two, buy 10, sell five. What are you getting for the fives at this point? <laughs> I'll have to dig in later and see what they're going for. Number seven, we have about 20,000 of the Jan 18 calls. Number six, 21,000 of the Jan 35s. Number five, our final put in the top 10 here, 25,000 of the June 8 puts. Once again, this is still uh, the dominant force out here from a put perspective on Bitto options. So intriguing stuff. Number four, we have 25,000 of the Jan 65s. Once again, these are have always been interesting to me. Number three, 27,000 of the Jan 15s. Number two, 31,000 of the Jan 25s. And the number one size options position in Bitto right now, which is pretty close to the overall ADV for Bitto. That shows how sizable his position is. 37, almost 38,000 of the Jan 30s. By the way, I looked up while we were talking these June 5 puts. When they went up, they went up back of last year. That's how old these positions are. These went up back in December of last year for prices around 33 cents. When Bitto was eleven dollars and ten cents, wow! Looks like paper was buying those too. They were buying. They bought ten thousand at a clip for thirty-two cents. Five thousand more for thirty-two cents. They bought them in chunks all day long. So they were loading up on the five puts, listeners. Now I have to know, listeners. I have to know. Was that also the day where they may be selling one and buying two? That then, which <laughs> if you're going to sell the ten puts and buy. One and a half or two of the five puts. Not usually the structure we would recommend because you need Bitto to really fall out of bed. And it doesn't seem like the puts, the 10 puts traded that same day. So I'll have to dig and see when those went up. But wow, yeah. Opening for size on the Jan, <laughs> excuse me, the June five puts listeners for 32 cents. Obviously, hindsight 2020, they're going to wish they sold those, but still. Uh, intriguing stuff nonetheless here as we keep on rolling to explore the altcoin universe it's time to move beyond bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace it's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe all right, everybody, time to explore the altcoin universe, even though we spent a lot of the crypto hot seat talking about all things altcoin. Nonetheless, let's dive into the number two in market cap, number one in a lot of your hearts. That is ETH. In fact, speaking of market cap, before we get there, let's break down the top 10 and see how things have evolved over the course of the past week. Number 10, still Solana, hanging out at about $8.6 billion worth of market cap. Number nine, it's Polygon, 8.8, so right above it there, listeners. And number eight, and Doge just has a, a death grip on the number eight spot. Nothing can dislodge it, at least for this week. <laughs> $10.9 billion worth of market cap in Doge. Number seven is Cardano, about $13.5 billion. Number six, XRP, kind of been hanging out in that range for quite some time. Listeners, you know the song and dance by now. XRP, $23.7 billion worth of market cap. Number five, it's USD coin, $30.5 billion. Number four, it's BMB, $51.3 billion. Number three, it's the old Tether, $81.7 billion. Then number two, it's ETH, $221 billion. And the big dog this week, of course, it's Bitcoin, $546 billion worth of market cap. In terms of action, what are we seeing since last show in ETH? Unlike the move we saw in Bitcoin, in terms of net on the week, where we still are a little bit away from where we were this time last week, ETH looks like we almost just dialed ourselves up at the end of the show last week. <laughs> it hasn't done much net. It was 1830 on the end of our last show, 1835 this week. So a whopping five handles on the week. Of course, in between, it had a little bit more range. Listeners threatened 2000, didn't quite get there. 1961 was the high. That was last Friday. Uh, the low, again, hot 24-hour period. The low coming Thursday, the day before, 1812 out there. So a decent little range on the week, even if we are net 
doing a whole heck of a lot of nothing. And as a result, not surprising that the ball would come in a little bit here. It was about almost a 56 last week, 55.6. This week, 51.6. They love their point sixes in ETH ball out there. So coming in about four points on the week. Skew wise, last week we were pretty heavily to the puts, nearly negative four. This week it's flattened out. It's pretty much flat, negative point three. So no bias really in either direction. If we go a little bit farther out, that's pretty much still the case. Six months out, the skew was flat last show, and it's pretty much flat again this show. So no real bias longer term on ETH as well, which is always fascinating. Remember, ETH loves a quarterly, but April rolling off the board in ETH now too. So Probably not going to be quite as substantial of a hit to OI as March was, but still taking some contracts with it this week. One and three quarters million calls open on Deribit this week. That's down about a quarter of a million contracts in this time last week. So that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, Puts right behind it, even though they have less to give. Puts almost shedding a quarter of a million contracts as well. They have 658,000 puts left open on Deribit. That's down 242,000 this week. So even Steven... (laughs) In terms of April coming off the board, which is interesting. You'd think the puts would give up a little bit less, but that is not the case. So we are still hanging out at pretty much this. So with this come off, we're seeing roughly three to one here in terms of calls over puts. But we obviously have seen it much higher out there in the past, almost four to one and beyond. Let's go out here to the top five and see what's lighting things up out here in terms of ETH positions. Number five, we have the 2400 strike. That's got 122,000 contracts open. That is a newcomer to the top five this week. Number four, we have the 2200 strike with 162,000 contracts open. That's down 47,000 contracts this week. Number three, the 2000 strike, a very important psychological level. 164,000 contracts open there. That's down a whopping 76,000 contracts. So that's showing you where a lot of this OI is coming from, listeners. Uh, number two, the 1800 strike, 231,000 contracts open there. That is down 30,000 from this time last week. And the number one size position in ETH options right now, the 1900 strike, 235,000 contracts down about 24,000 from this time last week. So obviously a lot of OI coming off the board here in ETH land this week. Let's do a quick run through the rest of the altcoin universe before we get out of here for this week, listeners. Solana. Again, kind of a nothing week, 21 and a half at the end of our show last week, 21.89 this week. So you're talking about 39 cents to the upside. XRP, same deal, almost literally on 45.7 cents last week, 45.9 cents this week. Doge, 7.8 cents last week, 7.8 cents this week. I'm getting the theme here, listeners. Litecoin bucking that trend a little bit, 87 and three quarters last week, 86 and three quarters this week. So giving up a buck. Uh, Cardano, 38.4 cents last week, a whopping 38.5 cents right back to unched. Uh, Polkadot, 5.93 last week, 5.70 this week, off about 23 cents. And our old friend Shiba, this one, not quite as unched. It was 0.00001 this time last week. This week is 0.00009. So ticking a little bit to the dark side there. So unfortunately, no Shiba Lambos this week. All right, everyone, that music means we have come to the end of another epic journey through the world of crypto. I want to thank our guests in the crypto hot seat this week, Mr. Jag Sidhu from Syscoin. If you want to check it out for yourselves, Syscoin, S-Y-S coin dot org is the place to go to check out the white papers, the upcoming news, all the info on wallets and everything else you want to check out out there. And of course... We'll have a lot more content coming at you throughout the week. If you're on the pro side, you'll be getting a pro Q&A with our buddy, Mr. Ash Vias, giving us his insight on international volatility. Should be kind of fun. Always throw some fun, dubious correlations in there as well. When he's not moonlighting as a successful novelist these days as well. So a lot of hats he wears coming into that pro Q&A hot seat. That should be a fun one, of course. Another live extravaganza coming up on Options Bootcamp on Wednesday because Mr. Dan is traveling next week, so I'm going to get two in the can this week. You pro folks can hear them both live. As well as, of course, I mentioned with Jag earlier, I was down at the OIC conference last week. All of that content, including the exclusive panel content, will be coming out to you folks on the network quite soon. So you pro folks are already getting a taste of that. It's starting to trickle out to you folks now. It'll trickle its way out to the rest of the network on the on-demand side in the coming weeks. So look for that. So if you are intrigued, 
by All Things Options Industry Conference. We don't have a deal with consensus, so I don't have consensus content for you. But I do have OIC, and it was pretty fascinating stuff. So you can stay tuned for that. And hey, saves you a plane ticket to Nashville, saves you a registration fee for the conference, which is not insubstantial, and a whole bunch else. Just because we like you folks. You can find out more information on all of that. Theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go. And then, of course, we'll be back again next week, another episode of the Crypto Rundown. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Crypto Rundown is brought to you by Amber Data. If you're entering the digital asset class, you'll need access to granular on-chain and market data from multiple venues to power research, trading, risk management, and compliance. Amber Data delivers comprehensive data and insights into blockchain networks, crypto markets, and decentralized finance, empowering financial institutions to apply traditional finance methods to digital assets. Amber Data eliminates the infrastructure setup, integration challenges, and maintenance headaches to access digital asset data, reducing cost and time to market to enter the digital asset class. Learn more and download their digital asset data guide at www.amberdata.io. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.